Hello, this is the Mushroom Wizard, and I'm back with you guys with another presentation regarding the mushrooms of Saskatchewan and the ways in which we go about identifying those mushrooms for the purpose of picking them. So, uh, today we're going to be looking at a different type of mushroom than usual. Uh, we're, we're not going to be focusing on edible mushrooms, we're going to be focusing on toxic mushrooms. And the reason for that is that anybody who really wants to get into this hobby uh, in a safe manner uh, needs to know these mushrooms as well, if not better than the edible ones. Uh, so this is Toxic Toadstools of Saskatchewan. I read in the glossary terms of a book called Mushrooms of the Boreal Forest that the definition for a toadstool is a derogatory term for mushrooms. And I found that to be uh, quite humorous. Uh, generally speaking, that, that name is associated with, with toxic mushrooms. So the genre we will be looking at today is Hapilopilus, Hebeloma, Anocybe, and Foliota. So what what can you expect from this presentation and what mushrooms are in this presentation? Uh, this mushroom or this presentation includes mushrooms that are often consumed by mistake because they bear some resemblance to a particular edible mushroom that you may be out looking for. Uh, these are mushrooms that will not necessarily kill you, but they are at least moderately toxic. So some of them can even do some longer term damage to things like kidneys and, and, and livers. Uh, these are mushrooms as well that every serious mushroom picker should be familiar with. So let's just jump right in here. So the first group of species that we're going to be looking at are the scaly cat mushrooms. Uh, these are species found in the foliota genus. And I've got three here that are very common in Saskatchewan. There may be more presence. Uh, like, like you've probably heard before, it's not entirely known all of the species that occur in Saskatchewan. So on the left hand side there, you can see Foliota terrestris. In the middle, that's Foliota squarosa. And on the right hand side, that's Foliota squarosoids. And I'm not going to bother with common names for this one. I'm not even sure that they have common names beyond scaly cap. Uh, so the cap for these mushrooms, and on the right hand side, just just to make a note here, you're seeing Foliota terrestris and the caps for Foliota terrestris. Uh, the next slide will show the caps for Foliota squarosa and squarosides, uh, squarosoids, sorry. So the cap is yellow to cinnamon to tan to brown uh, darker in the center, lighter at the margins. These have a convex to companulate shape, uh, often becoming more companulate with age. And that's found in uh, Foliota squarosa and Foliota squarosoids, which we'll see soon. And uh, you can see it is more of a flattening with age in Foliota terrestris, you can see below. But if you look to the right there, you can see a, a companulate mushroom. And I'll, I'll go over what companulate means in a second. Flattening should be obvious. Uh, these mushrooms have concentrically arranged, raised, and sometimes spike-like scales. You're going to see that in the next slide. Uh, the scales that you're seeing here are small raised scales that wear off more with age and they're brown in color whereas on the next slide you'll see uh, Foliota squarosoids is red in color and Foliota squarosa is kind of a, a tan in color tan to brown. Uh, the margin is scaly and tomentose so tomentose if you remember is kind of like a woolly or hairy feel to it. And uh, we'll go over why that happens when we get to the gills section. And these mushrooms uh, for Foliota squarosa and Foliota squarosoids, they grow up to about three inches across. And then Foliota terrestris is a bit bigger at four inches across. And there on the left, you see that Foliota squarosa. 
It's got that kind of tan scaling darkest at the center there. You can see it's still got a little bump, a little umbo after flattening out. And on the right hand side, you can see foliota squirrelsoids with that red, almost cinnamon red uh, scaling. It's very spike like. Now here are the size references for you. On the left you see Foliota terrestris. On the right you see Foliota squirrosa. And here you see uh, Foliota squirrosoids, again with those pointier spikes. So the gills of these mushrooms are off-white to tan, becoming rusty brown with age, or kind of rusty brown in spots uh, as it develops. Uh, they are adnate to the currents. They are close together. Short gills tend to be frequent on these mushrooms, and they are covered with a cortna when young. And they have a rusty brown spore print. So a cortna, if you remember, is similar to a partial veil, but where a partial veil is like a membrane that covers the gills, a cortna is more like a spider web. That's what it looks like. It's it's it's. Uh, a grouping of threads and when the cap expands those threads break and the threads remain often on the margin of the cap that's what gives it that hairy uh, woolly tomentose uh, uh, look to it so just gonna skip here to the next one there you can see a spore print and the all, they will all look the same. They'll all have the same spore print. On the left, you can see that cortna, and that is Foliota squero, squerosa. And on the right, you can see uh, fresher gills than the, the first photo as well. So the stipes are tan to brown to dusty red. The red you're gonna find more in uh, Foliota squerosoids. Tan to brown will be the other ones. Uh, they are darker near the base, as you can see on the right-hand side. So there's a ring zone. The stipe is bald above the ring and has the same scales as the cap below the ring. And we'll see that closer up in a second. Uh, these stipes are solid and fibrous. And they are up to 5 inches high for Foliota squirrosa, squirrosa and Foliota squirrosoids, and up to 7 inches high for Foliota terrestris. They're about one inch wide. You can see that sheath denellus there. So a sheath denellus is basically where um, you have this kind of shaggy, at least in these these ones, this sort of shaggy covering that goes right from the base up to uh, near the apex and then kind of flares out. And uh, then the actual stipe you can see there uh, coming out of it is actually white. And uh, that denellus is actually extending all the way down. And you can see just above that flare, flared lip, you can see a rusty brown spore deposit. The ecology is parasitic becoming saprobic. These grow directly on hardwoods or at the base of hardwoods for foliota squirrelsoids. Uh, they grow directly on or at the base of aspen and spruce for foliota squirrosa. And then for Foliota terrestris, they appear terrestrial. They're actually attached to roots or something along those lines. Uh, these clump together. You can see they, they cluster together fairly well. Uh, and they're found late summer through fall. Now these are a clustering mushroom. Uh, often with a clustering mushroom, you'll see the stipes joining together to form one single base. Uh, but that doesn't occur with this mushroom. They're all going to be independent stipes. The toxicity is mild to moderate. Uh, Foliota terrestris is probably uh, the mo more mild of the three. Symptoms include colicky burping, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. It lasts up to 48 hours. Now, it's not going to kill you, that's for sure, uh, but it is not pleasant. So for myself, this is the only mushroom that I've ever accidentally consumed and uh, been poisoned by. That was uh, when I kind of first got into mushroom picking and I was a little bit more headstrong and only using books that were very old and such. Um, 
and I thought I had found honey mushrooms. And that is what this mushroom is often mistaken for, mainly because they have the same uh, growth habits. They're, they're both parasitic and saprobic. Uh, they're both found in the fall. They have a very similar look to them. And uh, yeah, so me and my wife at the time, we, we, we ate a bunch of these and for 48 hours uh, at the cabin with only one toilet, uh, we became very creative in how we dealt with that because all those symptoms happen at once. So colicky burping, that's not so bad, but it is when you're vomiting and having diarrhea at the same time. So uh, a really telltale sign that what you're holding is a scaly cap mushroom is the smell. The smell is overwhelming at times if you turn it over and smell the gills. And they smell like a combination of what I can only describe as rotting garlic and an old spice cupboard. It's, it's like you're smelling like 10 different aromas at once. Some of them should be pleasant, but they mingle together in a very unpleasant way. Uh, some people do eat these. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe they, they have uh, some sort of tolerance to this, but I think what is actually happening there is they're actually eating one of the several foliota species that are edible and found in the States when I hear of accounts of that. Next species, this is the cinnamon bracket, Hapilopilus nigillans. So, uh, a cinnamon bracket is reddish orange to cinnamon in color, sometimes with concentric bands. You can see them faintly there on this bracket. It is fan-shaped or kidney-shaped. It is has a short stipe with a lateral attachment, so that means that the stipe is attaching to the mushroom from the side. That's because it's growing on wood or else it has a sessile attachment like you see here with, with uh, no stipe at all. It's just flush up against a piece of wood. Uh, the margin is cream. You can see that margin around the edge. It's uh, cream to pale yellow when young, uh, darkening a bit with age. And then it, it's usually just smooth. Sometimes it can be a little bit wavy. And we'll see that in photos upcoming here. Uh, when it's young, it has kind of like a velvety surface if you run your fingers across it and then it becomes bald and it has kind of a, a rough uneven surface to it there. Uh, these are fairly small. They only grow up to about three inches in diameter. Here you can see a size reference. So not the largest mushroom out there. The pores are turned tan to brown uh, and then the pore surface there uh, you can see the margin area, the marginal area around the edge is kind of uh, dark orange. Uh, the pores themselves are very large, like they're, they're, you don't need to zoom in on this photo at all because it's, uh, they're, they're so large and they're angular. They've got that honeycomb look to them. And this produces a white spore print. You can see one of the top one there has a fairly wavy margin as well. Uh, so. These are saprobic mushrooms. They are not parasitic as some polypores are. Uh, these grow directly upon decaying hardwoods and sometimes conifers as well. Uh, they cause white rot. These occur spring through fall and they are scattered to gregarious. Their toxicity is uh, fairly dangerous. So this mushroom is proof that the uh, thought that all polypores are safe to eat is a myth. That is a myth. There is this one and there may be a few others as well that contain significant levels of the toxin here which is polyporic acid. It is a neurotoxin. Many polypores contain small amounts. The cinnamon bracket contains massive amounts. Uh, you, can, you can test for it uh, with an acid and if you look to the right there the addition of an acid to this mushroom causes it to turn uh, kind of a brilliant sort of violet color. And uh, this, this mushroom is used in dyeing as a result. The symptoms of consuming this mushroom include nausea, dizziness, impaired movements, uh, impaired vision, encephalitis, violet colored urine, kidney and liver failure or damage. 
So this can get quite serious. And when people eat this mushroom, they are often mistaking it for uh, Fistulina hepatica, the beefsteak polypore. I'm just going to move to the next species here now. So this is actually a group of species. Uh, they're called fiber caps, and they are species in the Inocybe genus. So on the left, I've got Inocybe lacera. On the right, I have Inocybe napapes. And on the middle, I have Inocybe geophyla. Now, this does not represent all of the fiber caps found in Saskatchewan. Uh, I, I picked these because uh, they're good representations of what you should expect from fiber caps in Saskatchewan. There are many brown fiber caps, but I've got one on the right there that is scaly and uh, it's more uh, compressed with its fibers. Then I've got one on the, sorry, one on the right there, and then one on the left that has kind of that hairy look to it. And then in the middle, we have one of the only white fiber caps. So it, it looks very different. And this is a very common fiber cap, that you know, five geophyla. So it's one to know. But they all look fairly similar. So we'll take a look at the caps, and I've got the caps of the other two coming in the next slide. So the cap you're looking at there is uh, I. geophyla. So for I. napapes and I. lacera, those are the brown ones, they're chestnut to dark brown. And then you see off-white to gray and Inocybe geophyla. Uh, these are companulate. If you look to the right there, that is the textbook uh, image of a companulate cap. You see how it's got that bell shape. Uh, they flatten out with age and become umbilicate. And that is where you have flat, kind of dips in, and then it still has that bump in the middle. So these are longitudinally fibrillose and scaled in Inocybe lacera, and we'll look at that in a second, or hairy in Inocybe napapes and Iogeophyla, like you see right there, you see all those hairs, and then they become smooth with age. So the margin is smooth, or it is, as you can predict, tomentose. It's gonna have remnants of those hairs on them. Or uh, it will split uh, along the longitudinal grooves that it has as it flattens out. Often it'll have both occurring at once. And then these are up to about two inches across. So not very big mushrooms at all. On the left there, you see that, uh, Inocybe napapes and uh, Inocybe lacera there on the right. You can see it splitting there on the left and it's got that tomentose, the, the fibers are hanging down. And on the right, it's not so much hairy as it is compressed and uh, almost striate. Here we have a size reference for Inocybe geophyla. You can see that middle cap there uh, is flattened out, it dips down, and then it has that bump. And here we see the other two mushrooms, they look very similar. The gills are cream, becoming tan, then brown with age. They are adnate, so they reach across and just touch that stipe. They are close together, and those short gills are fairly frequent, frequent to present. It's hard to tell, some of them have more, some of them don't. Um, they are covered by a thin cortina when young, and we just spoke about that. It's like a spider web, almost a uh, veil. And uh, they have a brown spore print, or kind of a rusty brown spore print. And here are the other two ones. The one on the left looks almost more close than, or sorry, distant than close. Again, you'll see a bit of variation due to the amount of species we're talking about. There's a spore print for you. So the stipe is going to be the same color as or slightly lighter than the cap. Uh, these are cylindrical, so they're going to be the same width throughout. They're stalk-like, and when I say that, I mean it's very similar to what you'd expect from a dandelion, where you can kind of twist it a bit around your finger. Uh, they're fibrous. They're up to about three inches high, though usually shorter. 
Their ecology is mycorrhizal. And since we're talking about a whole bunch of different species here, um, they are mycorrhizal with pretty much any tree you can find. Uh, they are terrestrial, often found alongside paths. And they are found early spring, lasting through the summer. So when you're first getting out there to pick mushrooms and uh, you're excited to find stuff, often this is the first thing you find, and that's quite frustrating. And since they're alongside paths, uh, and you'll find that both in prairie and in uh, woodland settings, uh, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. They're very gregarious. You can see on the right hand side they've got that splitting very obviously occurring. I think that one is the torn fiber cap. It's the common name for that one. Uh, so the toxicity for these is I would say dangerous. Um, I don't think there is any account of anyone ever passing away from this mushroom but there certainly are accounts of people passing away from muscarine poisoning and that is what inocybe species contain and the reason that they're not killing people regularly uh, like like some of the cletocybes can uh, is because they're so small. So the symptoms include heavy salivation, sweating, uncontrolled tear flow, uh, abdominal cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, blurred vision, difficulty breathing, and heart palpitations. So these can be especially serious for people with heart conditions or people with things like asthma or, or uh, respiratory conditions and a combination of the two would be a big big bad there so let's move on to the next mushroom and that is the rooting poison pie this is hebeloma radicosum so the cap is gray uh, to brown in color often modeled together as you see there uh, it is convex flattening out with age uh, there, the surface, if you touch it, it's sticky. The margin is down rolled when young and then kind of rolled inwards and then becoming smooth or appendiculate. And appendiculate is where you have that membranous partial veil covering the, the gills and then the, the mushroom flattens out and the, ga the, the veil rips and leaves remnants hanging down from the sides of the margin. And I'll show you a photo of that in a second. And these grow up to about three inches in diameter. But you can see why it's called a rooting poison pie right there. The stipe is quite a bit larger. So the gills are very unique. And you can see on the right hand side just some veil fragments kind of hanging in there. Um, but these gills are white turning reddish brown with age. You can kind of see that transformation there. They are add next, so they reach across and touch the stipe. They are crowded together. They are forked. And if you look at the photo down on the bottom, uh, you can see the forking of those gills very clearly. Uh, and they are serrated. So if you look up real close, you'll see a fine serration along the gills themselves. Uh, there are short gills present as well as being forked. So that's kind of unique. And uh, this is covered with a partial veil when young, and it produces a rust brown spore print. And there's the spore print for you. The stipe is going to be off white above the ring, and then brown below. We're going to look at that ring in a second. Again, you probably guessed that's a sheathing ring. Uh, it is fusel form to rooting, the stipe is. And fusel form, if you remember, that's where it's thickest in the middle about halfway up the stipe and then it tapers at the base and at the apex uh, and it can also be rooting and if you remember the size reference we actually saw a fusel form next to a rooting and rooting is basically as it sounds almost got a carrot shape to it where it tapers towards the base uh, it attaches uh, to the cap with a central attachment it has heavy scaling below that ring on the sheath and then above it's smooth and Kind of whitish and then it's up to six inches high so the stipe is quite quite high and two inches thick and often you'll find that a good component of that stipe is buried beneath the ground and there's a close-up of the annulus it is sheathing and you can see it's kind of like pendant or flaring with that 
very exaggerated lip. The ecology is mycorrhizal with hardwoods and conifers. Um, now, what's unique about this mushroom's ecology is that the fruiting bodies occur where ammonia from rodent urine has accumulated. And if I remember correctly, the, the rodent that usually causes this mushroom is the shrew. So shrew, shrew nests or anything around that area where there's an abundance of uh, shrew urine building up is where these mushrooms will be found. They are terrestrial, they are found solitary to scattered, and they are found summer through fall. These are fairly dangerous. They smell like almonds and they contain an unknown toxin, or at least unknown when I wrote this uh, with the sources that I was looking at. And those, those, this toxin or toxins cause a very severe gastrointestinal distress. They can last up to a day or two. Next mushroom. Next two mushrooms. Okay, these are the poison pies. So we just looked at the rooting poison pie, which is quite a bit different than these. Uh, these are the poison pies. So the regular poison pie is Hebaloma CF crystalliniform up on the left hand side. CF means similar to. And then the rough stock poison pie, Hemaloma CF synapizans, is on the right. So again, similar to Hebaloma synapizans. And I'll talk about that in the ecology section. The cap is off-white to tan in color for Hebaloma crystalliniform. You can see that's what we're looking at on the right. And then tan to brown in color for Hebaloma synapizans. And then they're a bit darker in the center. So on the next uh, couple of slides here, you'll see Hebaloma synapizans as well. So this is a convex mushroom flattening out with age. It has a sticky surface, just like the rooting poison pie did. At times, the surface is uneven or even kind of pocked in places there. And uh, it has an enrolled margin, fairly enrolled, that becomes wavy later on. And that's what you're looking at here is a wavy margin. And this, these mushrooms grow up to about five inches in diameter. And there's the uh, rough stock poison pie, so quite a bit darker in color. Everything else is the same though. Here's a size reference for the poison pie. Here's a size reference for the rough stock poison pie. So again, big difference in the color. Now, sorry, there's some typos there. Uh, these gills are cream to brown in color with red spots developing with age. Now what happens is uh, liquid, beads of liquid start to occur on the gill plates and they drop down and where these beads of liquids are occurring, beads of usually like water, um, that's where you're gonna see those red spots because they will contain spores. Uh, the mushroom is sinuate and you can see it's got a bit of a notch there. It's kind of actually hard to see in this photo. Should have picked a different one for that. Uh, the gills are close together. The short gills are very frequent. And uh, if you look there very closely, you can see again that these are serrated. And that's probably what's causing the, the droplets of water to occur. So these have a brown to rusty brown spore print. There you see it. Nice thick one. So the stipe is the same color as the cap. They are cylindrical to bulbous. They have a central attachment. And in Ebaloma synapizans, they are covered with concentric bands of flat brown scales. We'll see that in a second, because this is Hebaloma crystalliniform that we're looking at on the right. And they're up to about four inches high and one inch thick. And you can see on the left-hand side, it's uh, not the clearest photo, but it's got kind of like brown scales kind of banded up the... Uh, the stipe. So in terms of ecology, neither of these species, well this isn't really ecology, but we're, we're going to go on the taxonomy of it and that will lead to uh, answering some questions about the ecology. So neither of these species actually occurs in North America. These species are, the names are used to represent a group of species for each name 
that occurs here and may or may not be named or known as of yet. So we have a fair amount of species then that bear uh, the exact same macroscopic resemblance to uh, Hebuloma crystalliniform as well as Hebuloma synapazans. So we just go with that. And in common names, you know, it, there, there's no real reason to differentiate between mushrooms for our purposes of mushroom picking at least uh, that look identical to each other and have the same qualities and toxicity. So these are mycorrhizal with hardwoods and conifers, pretty much everything. So again, that's why, uh, because we don't know really how many species we're dealing with here. Uh, they are terrestrial. They are found scattered to gregarious or forming rings. They're very common. I find them in city parks. And these are found summer through fall. And these can resemble quite a number of mushrooms. They have just a very basic, basic agaric uh, appearance. And it's just really when you look at the finer details, like the serrated gills and stuff like that, that you start to see uh, the unique qualities of the mushroom. Again, these are dangerous. They smell like radishes. So they don't smell like almonds, like the rooting, the rooting poison pie. These ones smell like radishes and they contain an unknown toxin. Once again, it causes severe gastrointestinal distress. And that's everything for this presentation. This will be the first of uh, at least five or six presentations on the toxic mushrooms of Saskatchewan, because there's quite a few that you need to know. And um, if you liked what you see, hit the like and subscribe buttons. And yeah, I will see you next time with uh, yet again, more mushrooms of Saskatchewan. This is the Mushroom Wizard. Have yourself a nice evening.